So welcome to the besotted Pride of West London retro podcast. And I have on the end of the line here a very good friend of mine, wicked striker, big hero at Griffin Park, Mr. Lloyd Awusu. How you doing, Lloydie? How are you, Billy? You good, mate? I'm very well. And yourself? Not too bad, man. Not too bad. Just chilling at the moment. Well, you're chilling. I mean, there's some sort of time difference between here and where you are at the moment now, because you're in Australia at the moment. Is that right? Yeah, correct, mate. I'm in New South Wales. Uh, I'm in Terrigal at the moment. So uh, 11 hours ahead of you guys back in the UK. That's right. And there was a bit of a celebration yesterday as well in Australia, wasn't it? Or was that, yeah, yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. The boys done a, it was a great game, you know, winning 2-1 the Asian Cup. Just going to put sort of Australia on the map and uh, it's only, it's only going to be beneficial for the football in this country. That's right. And obviously you're very much involved in Australian football, which we're going to probably come to a little bit later. Um, yeah. You know, play for a few teams, stuff like that out there. So, you know, that's obviously a good feeling for all your sort of teammates and the people that you play with as well, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, you know, it's, that's, that's what it's all about, you know, it's all about giving, giving back what I've, I've had in my career. So hopefully that's, uh, like I say, working here in Australia now on the coaching side, I've very think I think going to help people, and especially the, the, the youth, as I say, the, the nurture of the youth of this country. That's right. So listen, Lloyd, we're going to have a little chat, go for a potted history, Lloyd Owusu and his football career. Just to give a little background for people that may or may not know, Lloyd Owusu, go for all your teams, ex Brentford striker, also played for Brighton, Sheffield Wednesday, Reading, Yeovil, Luton, Barnet. He was at Adelaide United for a bit, White City in Australia and Sydney as well, but started off at Slough Town. Like, you know, yeah. so how did that move, move come about? Because you from Slough to Brentford. Yeah, well, it was actually crazy. I was obviously playing for Slough Town in the old conference. I made my debut as an 18-year-old, scored four goals in my debut under Brian McDermott. Uh, who signed me as a kid and I was loving my time there we were actually in the conference and we were doing really well uh, with regards to nearly getting promotion into the, into the football league but uh, with that season the final season of I think it was 90 I think it was 98 uh, the, the football league said that if if Slough Town get promoted they will not be allowed to go up because of their ground capacity there's was something wrong with the seating but the chairman was very reluctant at the time to do anything about it because he actually thought the grounds were even better than some grounds were actually in the foot, in the old division for it back then. So uh, they demoted us. The actual league demoted Slough Town. So Brian McDermott obviously was the manager then with a, a cusp of very good young players and uh, we obviously but we all still had years left on our contracts and uh, they turned around and said if, if any of my young players get opportunities to go elsewhere we're not going to stand there where we'll let them go. So for my, luckily for myself I actually went on trial to Walsall uh, they were making a few headwaves for me. So I went up there for a month trial. And then uh, I remember probably, I was only probably two weeks into the trial. And even then, to be fair, but I was really nervous about going. So they were, they were the old Division 3 at the time. So it was like two, three steps above to what I was playing at. And when I had a 21-year-old getting an opportunity to go and play with full-time players, it was it was nervous. But two weeks into the trial, I got a phone call from Brian McDermott. He said, uh, Lloyd, I've he goes, uh, where are you? I said, I'm just on my way into training. He goes, I'll go and see Ray Graydon and tell him, Tell him, tell him thank you for the opportunity, but I've just sold you to Brentford. And I thought it was a wind up, to be fair. I'm thinking, wow, because I knew quite a few guys at Brentford, as in, especially some of the youngsters like CJ, Clement, James, who used to be, who used to be, who was, ended up being my boot boy. Uh, I knew him from my days in Slough because of his family and everything. And I knew the likes of Marcus Bent, obviously, as a y- youngster myself, watching these guys being pros there. And I was like, wow, this has got to be a joke, surely. So uh, he goes, no, 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 he goes, I've sold you to Brentford. They want to come, they want to meet you at the airport this afternoon before they fly out to Spain. So I went to see Ray Gray and I just said to him, look, Ray, thanks for the opportunity, but Brian's obviously told you uh, Brentford have come in for me. So he goes, yeah, he goes, oh, fantastic, Lloyd. He goes, You're st- we're still keen for you here, but the opportunity's there for you already. You've got to take it. So I actually went back, came, drove, down the M- drove down the M6 from Walsall down to London. I met Brian at his house. In, uh, I was at his mum's house in Sipida and then we went to the airport. So on my route, on route to the airport, I had to call my agent at the time, was a guy called Lan Rioki. So we, we met him as well at the airport, got to got to the airport before the boys had departed. So I met up with uh, Ron Nodes, may he rest in peace, and uh, Ray Lurton. Uh, so they pulled me aside. We just had a little chat in the cafe. And then uh, the actual deal nearly got, no, not many people know this, but the actual deal nearly got taken away from me because uh, 
uh, Landry wasn't he was he wasn't happy with the deal that they offered me. They offered me a three year deal you know, on X amount of money. I mean, for me, if, if, I didn't even bother about the money. It was just the opportunity of being a professional. And Landry was going. He said to Ron at the time, "No, this this is the kind of deal is ludicrous for my kind of player who's done so well." Blah blah. He was really just really posh. And I was like, I was like, in my and in my head, I was like, "Please, what's this guy doing?" So I, to, I actually had to phone Danny Bailey, who I don't know many people might not. He played in the in the football league, but he was my mentor from from day one. So I phoned up Danny and said, "Danny, you need to speak to Manly because this table, this deal's going to get taken off the table for me." So uh, Danny's phoned up. Larry said, look, Larry, the kid wants to sign this, let him sign it. And he goes, and then Larry said, okay, if he wants to sign it, up to him. But finally he signed it, uh, and then one knows, and the, and the team obviously went in the distance, back to him, and I think, they, I think they were going to, I think they were going to Marbella, I think it was on Malaga, for pre-season tour. So obviously they've, they've all gone, I've just signed, I've just signed a, a draft copy of the contract. And then uh, obviously a couple of days later, I just had to go to the club, just do the official papers, and then, the boys came back after a week and then uh, I joined them on the training track and uh, the rest was history, as they say. That's right. That's right. And you, I mean, you had two spells at Brentford. In your first spell, you scored 60 goals in 163 games, which is like a really mm. wicked goal scoring, you know, record. Like I said, there's, the manager was Ron Nodes, but also there was, you know, you also had Ray Lewington as a manager later on and yeah. also Steve Coppel. So you had, you know, three yeah. wicked managers that you played under. Now, exactly. It's interesting, though, because, I mean, you say Ron Nodes, and like I say, rest rest in peace. I know there was a lot of bad blood between Brentford fans and, and himself, but that's in the past now, and, and you know, mm. unfortunately he's, he's died now. You have to respect that and respect him. But of course. Ron Nodes, what was it like being managed by him? Because it's really weird. He's he's a chairman, buys a club and says, no, yeah. mate, I'm going to manage. Yeah, again, for me, it was I was in, in awe of the guy in regards of who he was, you know, because... As a kid watching the top league of Crystal Palace and them days, knowing the chairman one knows, like he's like a massive name in football, and for him to come up and want to buy someone like myself from non league, it was just, it was just like wow, I was just like blown away. And like I said, it was a bit of a strange transition because obviously he didn't really have the the management sort of style as a manager, where obviously Ray Lee took everything, which everyone probably knows. He took all the trade and everything. So uh, Ron was obviously the gaffer, but obviously he was more of the face just to be the face of it all. But uh, Ray Lou actually took everything with, with, with guys to train in and majority of even the team talks, etc. So it was all good though. Yeah, I mean, at the moment now, I mean, we find it really interesting. There's a there's a podcast up on the Besotted website at the moment now. If you do audioboom.com forward slash Besotted and there's a park-like documentary. That first year that you're at Brentford and the BBC came, followed you around pretty much for the home season in the dressing room and everything like that. Um, talking mm. to you, talking to Nodesy, talking to the fans. Really interesting insight of what went down at Brentford. And the, I mean, the question that I was asking, everyone's asked at the time, you had Nodes, you had Brian Sparrow, you had Terry Bullivant, you had Ray Lewington. Mm. Who was really doing the business? Because you had, sort of, it seems like a lot of cooks in that side, but there yeah. had to be one yeah. real chief. Yeah, of course there was. I mean, obviously, uh, Ron was obviously the main chief. Uh, but obviously the methodical the methodical side of it was definitely from my aspect I thought was Ray Lewis, you know, uh, the way obviously the training sessions were planned uh, and then obviously talking in at game days. Obviously uh, Ron would do a bit of talking, but I thought for me it was more about, it was more about Ray Lewis and then. Yeah. yeah, and we were like, you know, we were the big buck team. We were the money team at the time. Ron Nodes came in and, you know, he was putting money into the club. I mean, Okay, it's come out, you know, that now exactly how that money was being spent. But yeah, he was putting money in the pub, which made the fans feel good. And we were playing big mm. money for players. I mean, 750000 for Herman Horidison. We even yeah. bid 600000 for that Salmon Howarth, was it? He ended up going to, yeah, to Wigan, I think it is. Wigan, yeah. That's, yeah. that's right. Um, but we built a wicked team. I mean, you know, you look at that... Tony Folan, Rollins, Horidison, yeah. Boxall, Evans, even Andy Scott, Charlie yeah. Oway, Quinn, Batesy. I mean, that was like a pure side. I mean, I know it's only Division 2 or Division 3 it was, was but that team that you went straight into, I mean, they were just boom, on fire, wasn't it? Yeah. It was really, it's, it's funny you say that because when you look at the team, there was a lot of experience, yeah, but if you actually look at the actual spine of, I'm always a member of the spine of our start at 11, there was three guys, myself, Martin Rollins, and Darren Powell, down the spine, centre half, centre midfield, and centre forward, all played non league the year before. It was, a, it was an unbelievable contrast of where Ron Rose was very clever because he knew 
us non-league boys had that hunger and desire to really, really succeed and obviously prove everyone wrong. And then you had the experience of the likes of Jamie Bates, Rowan Aspinall, and Charlie Outways around us, but bringing us through. So I think you just had, I just think it was, it was a perfect recipe with what we did that whole year, you know. Yeah. And, and, and I've got Steve Tidy, who's asked the question, and what he's asking is that, what was your best goal you scored at Redford? Wow, goal. best goal. And favourite goal. Gee, which, I mean, I'm a, I mean, I'll probably say the favourite goal's got to be the, the championship deciding, you know, going coming down to the last game of the season. You know, in, I, mean, I, think, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure we could have even had a draw, I think, against them. Is that correct? Or did we need to win that game? I think that if we won, I can't remember exactly. This is up at Cambridge. It was uh, yeah. whoever won that game would have won the championship. Yeah, whoever won the game won the actual cha- championship. Was it? Cause we, were, we were both already promoted. That's whoever right. won the game won the actual championship. That's so, right. like I said, it was to, to score that one goal in front, and, it, and the thing was, it was in front of all the Brentford fans. It was just, uh, it was just, it was dreams come true, mate. It was just fantastic. That was an absolutely fantastic day, and for me again, that was one of my best days out at being a Brentford fan. Yeah. You know, we've had, I think we've had four, is it we had four for promotions now? Um, Peterborough, Cambridge, um, you know, we've had the last one as well. Um, but that yeah. was a, that was a that was a pro, and then we were at Darlington. We went up at Darlington as well. But that to me was a proper day out, you know. And look, mm. that team that you played with, like you said, Ija, Powley. I mean, what was it like? Yeah. You know, who was who were the top players in that side? Do you think? You know, who do you have real respect for? For me, yeah, again, another one that come from the league, Gavin Munn. Gavin oh, yes, was one of the of best players I've even played with. Gavin was Gavin was tremendous. What his, his technical ability on the park was unreal. It's the way he used to ping a ball. It's just this is all round game. And then you like you had Herman Riders who who was then you could I mean he was top he was a top top player. Uh, you know, uh, obviously then you had the likes of Danny Boxer, Quinny. Uh, Andy Scott, even I love playing up front with, with Scott Partridge. We just had a, just had a we just had a great team, you know. It was just a great blend of youth and experience and some really good players, even Woody and Goal, you know. So uh, that's right. We're, we're a good bunch. Yeah, and and again, you finished top scorer that season, scored twenty five goals. You know, so, mm. so it's not not a bad tally, right, you know. Then the following season, we went up. We didn't do that well. Why do you think we struggled? I mean, we finished seventeenth that season. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a new transition, you know, certain players obviously left, the likes of Herman and then not left, you know, some good quality players. But again, it's a new blend again, it's a new division. And I think the aim for the club that year was to make sure that we, we didn't bounce, go back down like most clubs do. So I think at least we, we stayed with ourselves and, and stayed there. Uh, like I say, on a personal note, of course, as a striker, you always want to score more goals. I think, I think that year did I score over 12 or 14, I'm not too sure. But again, a few injuries here and there as well, because the, yeah, the first season, and I, I think not many people even know that with regards to my first season, I was the only player, I was the only player at Burnham in my first year to play every single game, whether it be it, there's a few on the bench, but I actually played every 56 games I played. I played every single game. That's, a, so, that's yeah. an unbelievable record, man. Yeah, so yeah, like I said, the second season, it was, it was like, a, it's all new to us, you know what I mean? You're playing up against better players, better teams. So uh, we were just like, we were just happy to consolidate and, and stay in the, in the league, you know? Yeah, and, I mean, it was a, a tricky 18 months, you know, after the euphoria of going up, that Cambridge game, which is fantastic. You know, it, it was a little bit of tricky. Results didn't go 100% our way. And, and Ron Lodes became more and more or less and less popular with the fans. And uh, there was a bit of a relationship between him and the fans, you know, and he, you know, he, you know he's like, he used to get really angry, just say, look, you know, I'm the one that's paying the money. I do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it got to the stage where, we lost in the cup to Kingstonian and we got knocked out mm. by Kingstonian, which was a proper shame yeah. that was. And that's when he threw in the towel. I mean, what was that day like? That day was horrible, to be fair. Because I'd even ask, when they get me wrong, we're riding high, or we're, we're a professional team in the Division 2 down and we're playing against a conference, even, I think when a conference, even one below a conference than Kingstonian. And if I'm not, I think we lost, I think it was 3-1 against them, I think three it was. One. It was a killer. Uh, yeah, it was three one uh, killer. I mean, I just remember, I just remember the abuse all of us as players we got from the fans during the game while we were losing. And it was just a terrible thing. But I guess that's the love of the FA Cup, isn't it? There's always got to be a, a scalp. And unfortunately for us that year, it was us. It was, and that sort of saw the beginning of the end of Ron Nose because he threw in the towel. He decided, right, I'm not manager anymore. Then he decided to withdraw all the money, and everything like that. And it was a dark few years for Brentford after that, you know. But um. 
interesting as well because, like I said, other players you played with, you played with Terry, um, we played with Evans as well. Yeah, Paul um, Evans, yeah, 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 Paul Evans, you know, and he, do you remember when he scored that goal from the halfway line? Right, oh, done it, done it twice in a week, didn't he? Done one against Burnley, done the one at, the one at home, but, I think, at Preston, home at Preston, Preston at home. and away to Burnley. And away to Burnley. That's yeah, right. It was unbelievable goal. It was, that, it was unbelievable, goal unbelievable against Preston. And yeah. do you remember who's managing Preston at the time? Oh, no. Who was it that then? It's David. I'm pretty sure it's David Moyes. Yeah, it would have sure. been. Probably would have been. Yeah, yeah. David yeah, Moyes, been, wicked yeah. manager at the time there for Preston. They were, they yeah. were flying high. And he scored that goal from the halfway mm. line, but it was just on another level. Um, and also mm. that year as well, there was a player who made his debut for Brentford. And he's still in our squad at the moment now. You remember? Yeah, Kev O'Connor. Kev O'Connor. That's right. That's when he yeah. made his first first yeah. year. And the funny thing is that he actually started as a striker, didn't he? Yeah, Kev was a quality. I mean, when I, was going up, when I first got there, he was in the youth team. He was just phenomenal. He was a prolific. But then again, he had, he had, he had that whole technical thing about his game anyway, where, where he, even in training, he'd play in different positions and you could just tell that he, he could adapt to any position where he was requested to. And like I said, Ended up being a tremendous right back as well, centre midfielder. So he's, he's, done, he's done tremendous at the, at the club, you know, and fair play to him. Real credit to the kids. Yeah, that's right. He's still there and he's still doing his coaching and he's still as loyal as you can ever be to Kev. Um, he, you know, he, as you say, you, you you cut him and he bleeds red and white, mate. He's a, he's Brentford through mm. and through. You know, yeah. there's a few other players as well, though. I mean, just parking back, Ivor Ingemarsson. You know, yeah. he was a boy, wasn't he? Ivor. He was a character, he was a good lad, you know I mean, kept himself to himself. Yeah. And he was really proper with his training methods, which, which when you look back at it, Air Poetry means I was an him. He was always doing extra training and was stretching after training. And I think that was, I think that was the, the European mentality that he had, obviously coming from Iceland, he got. So uh, a lot of players started to do a lot of extra training, what he was doing. And again, it was really good because it prevented injuries and everything. So he was just... Uh, he probably introduced a lot of that to both the players individually when he when he came to the club. So he was a really good guy. And uh, and there's also a player who had an extremely exotic European name as well, Lorenzo Pinamonte. Right, yeah. So he was the one that, I think he was the one who actually scored a goal against King Sony in, in that three-one game. I think it was. Uh, it, yeah, he was a character. That guy. I wonder where he is. I think somewhere in Italy. Probably a little playboy when he was he was a, he was a character. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Any stories? Come on, come on, Lloyd. Give us some stories, man. Oh, man, I don't even. He was just like a, he just he just came from. I think he came from Bristol City, I believe. He just come real for. He was this guy with his long hair, tanned, with the with the pigtail in it, just with the bands. You know, what I mean, the Alice bands rocking up. We just thought this is a rock star. He, he was a cool kind of character, though. Because he was only young, but uh, he didn't really, obviously, he didn't have the best of times at Brentford. Yeah. So, obviously, one of those sent him packing after that. That's right. Similar to Hotta, you know, with the Alice band now and the long hair, right, you know? Mm. So, yeah, Ben. But, you know, that, that was, like I said to you, some character. But, again, coming back to it, there was a lot of characters in that side, like I said to you. You know, you've got mm. Iger Anderson, you know, Powley. You know, there's lots of mm. characters. There must be a tale. You must have a funny tale of something that went down. Oh man, I don't know. I, mean, I think what stays, I think we have to keep a few in the house, you know. I know over the years we had, I mean, like we had obviously we, were, we had the boys' nights out, we had the pre-season trips, end of season trips, and uh, yeah, we were just a tight bunch. We just, you know, I mean, everyone just took the mickey out of everyone, and uh, we were just, we were just caught jokes in, at the end of the day. That's right. And listen, after afterwards, Ray Lewington, he took over as manager, and you had him for a year. How was that year with, yeah. with Ray, the top door? Yeah, again, top draw. Ray Lewis is a great. He's a great coach. I just thought he was. I thought his his coaching methods were fantastic. Le- learned a lot from him from day one. And then look at him now. He's assistant to England. England assistant national team. So he must he must be doing a good job somewhere. You know. That's right. And then we moved on to that. Is the man again? One year at Brentford, but you know, he was a fantastic manager, Steve Coppel. And I mean, that season yeah. for you was another top season, wasn't it? Yeah, for me, I mean, he's been my, I mean, it's, it's no secret, he's been my best manager I've ever played for with regards to his man management styles, the way he prepared us, uh, just to, he showed the players respect and uh, obviously the players gave him respect because of who he was. But yeah, that season was just, um, it was a great year individually for myself and collectively as a team. 
he brought through some great, great players through uh, him and Willie Downs doing their scouting missions, bringing in the likes of even young Steve Sidwell from Arsenal as a young kid. He done so well for us. Uh, like I said, myself and the many prop Ben Burgess from Blackburn. And I just had a great partnership with him up front. Uh, relished that with him. That was just yeah. probably one of my best strike partners I've ever played with. You know, it's weird because it's, it's actually, I've never actually played with a, a guy so sort of similar sort of style to me. Two big guys. I've always had that little and large combination. Uh, yeah. And I think we just, you know, for some reason, we just gelled so well. I mean, I think we scored between us 40 goals or something between us. Uh, you know, it was, just, it was just brilliant, but it was just unfortunate last game of the season against Reading. Obviously, we needed to win, and they only needed to draw, and they went up automatically. So, yeah, but overall, it was a great, great year. It was a great year. And again, we're going on about the players. Paul Smith, Dobson, Inga Marson, Powell, yeah. Ija, Martin Rowlands. Hunt, Sidwell, Evans, yeah. Bert, Ben, Bert, Big Ben Burgess, as you said, you know, yeah. Danny Boxall, Kev O'Connor, mm. you know, it was, you know, that side was, you know, it was, I think it was, again, it was iconic and Reading did score that equaliser, Jamie Curiton, who, you know, Brentford yeah. fans <coughs> hate that guy because every time he seems to score against us, he even scored against us with Dagenham this season, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I know, and he's still scoring fair play to the guys, 39 you now, still banging off, and he's 49 to Kiro, banging in goals. Uh, but yeah, that was glad that day, because we, we played so well as a team. We just played, and he, I think, I remember, I think he came on, I think he scored it 76 minutes, and then, uh, yeah, just loved it, and that's dinked it, and then, yeah, we just had to go through the playoffs, but that's life. Yeah, that's the playoffs, and, you know, the playoffs that Brentford never, ever win. I mean, to be fair, oh. Huddersfield, two legs, Last time we played Huddersfield, they did us in the playoff semi-final. So at least we got one back over them this time, didn't we? Yeah, yeah that was again. We, we went up there, and we kept there. We got the nil-nil draw, which was good to come back to us. But then, like I say, we started off. I always remember we started off. Correct, we started off on, like a nightmare. They scored after I think in a minute. Boofy, and the boost scored after a minute. And we're like we were shell shocked. Yeah, you know, and uh, which is crazy. And then luckily, Pally came up with a header for us in the, in, that, in the first half. And then the uh, second half, I just remember, as soon as we came out, 46 minute, the ball broke. I think the ball got hit out. So obviously, we attacked, it, we attacked them, and then the ball just came in the edge of the box for me. I just put, a, put my right foot to it, just curled it around the keeper, and just, you know, I just remember staying off to the, to the away fact to our fans. Just, you know, just, it you was know, just fantastic. And then to get to the final, and obviously lost to Stoke. Yeah. It was a bit gutted, really. And I've got to ask you about that Stoke game because the thing is, obviously, we'd come back off a great season. We should have gone up, but we didn't go up um, mm. and automatically. But then the playoffs came and we, you know, we got through fairly convincingly. And that Stoke game came. Yeah. We were third. I think they were sixth. We were. Yeah. We should have run that game. What went wrong? No, we should have. I mean, to me, a lot of things a lot of people don't probably know. Again, I mean, I can, make, I can sort of divulge now. It's not, not too bad. I mean, we beat them, obviously. I think it was even three, four weeks prior to that game. Three, one. I remember City scoring a great goal. We beat him, and I thought, yeah, we've got him. You know, we had psychologically, we had him because they beat us at their place three, two. I think it was, and we beat him at our place three, one. But come the final, to be fair, I think it was. I think it was a bit of a, a lot of players still. To be fair, I think a lot of were shell shocked. Big, big arena. Even though a few of us have already been the, the year before in the LDV. Uh, but myself, anyway. I mean, myself. Not, not many people probably know until obviously you're going to find out now. I actually, I actually was injured in that game right. uh, prior. I, I, I done my knee. I was due to uh, my cartilage was done, uh, and I just, I mean, run, uh, Steve Cobb said no. He goes, look, because I know your knee's done, but I'll set you what you want to do. And I, I just thought I just had to play for the club because you know, I mean, I love that club and I love the players. I just thought we can do it. Uh, I'm not saying that was the reason why we lost. I mean, I, I still, I think, I don't think I had a bad game that day, but I just went through the pain barrier. Uh, and I think so. So I think so. I think even Martin Rowlands maybe even had a had an injury as well. Uh, right. So again, there was a couple of us not 100, percent but we just had, we just went for the cause for the club because we loved them so much and tried to do our best, you know. Okay. But, so yeah, like I said, I think we we were shell, a lot of them were shell shots. Big big crowd, especially Stoke. Stoke brought them in. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure they just brought brought about 25,000. Yeah, Thirty thousand, right. we had on oh, ten thousand in the corner, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they were they were making a lot of dominant noise on the, yeah. at the Millennium Stadium. Yeah, it was it wasn't a great day out. It has to be said, but then neither of yeah, yeah. any of our players games have been a great day out. But listen, mm. after that, okay. I mean, I know that you moved on, but just looking back at that, because the Brentford team was pretty much dismantled, and and, and mm. quite a few of them ended up with Steve Coppel at at Reading. Yeah. 
you know, ironically. Yep. Now, the question I'm going to say to you is that if Curitan hadn't come on and dinked the keeper and we had won that game against them, do you think that we yep. might have been able to emulate what Reading did? Because obviously Steve Cobble probably would have stayed with us, the team would have been together. What do you reckon? Yeah. I don't know, it's just a tough one because I must admit, uh, as a player, as much as a lot of us love Brentford, we've been there. Uh, done really well and a lot of us are out of contracts as fans could probably appreciate as well as much as you love clubs well, you, you've still got to look after yourself financially as a as a footballer as well uh, whether Brentford would have been able to keep most of us on the financial aspect because a lot of us and it was a time of the ITV Digital there was a lot of big money going around clubs and uh, even more obviously as championship clubs looking at our players as well and big name championship clubs you know so uh, it would have been a big one it would have been a call on Brentford after to see what they would have been off obviously of offering players to stay and obviously seeing what other clubs were offering players to, to come to so it would have been a, would have been a big call but it, it was a tough one to call you know Bill to say whether the whole team would have stayed together but uh, I did if we did who knows what could have happened because like you say they'd have done it so yeah so you moved to Sheffield Wednesday um, how, yeah. was, how was your time there because I know that the manager brought you in and I remember you talking to you just after you moved and you said the manager he's well into you he was backing you big time he was well into you then yeah. then he left and a new manager came yeah. on didn't I there? and that yeah. kind of didn't yeah. go in your favour he didn't go in my favour at all so he so you were coming for me because that, obviously I went to after the, straight after the playoff final against like I went, I went in for my operation uh, and then I was there was loads of clubs after me that year I had about six or seven clubs I was talking to in the end, agreed to sign for Sheffield Wednesday. I had the operation, and it was weird because I always said to the boys while I was in my rehab, I'm going to make my debut against Sheffield United and I'm going to score my first touch. I, I'm, I always tell the boys, and even if you see the, if you ever see my goal again on YouTube, you always, when I, you see, if you can lip read me, talk, shout to Alan Quinn uh, and Paul McLaren, I said, what did that, what did that effing tell you? What did that effing tell you? Because I always said I was going to score the cop end with my first touch and for myself, dream come true. So yeah, that happened. But then, yeah, we, we didn't have the best of starts at Sheffield Wednesday. We had a great team, but just, just could not win games. Uh, and then, obviously, we got relegated that season. And then, uh, obviously, Terry Yorov left. And then Chris... Uh, I think it was What's his name again? Uh, the goal, the old goalkeeper, Chris Turner, sorry. Chris Turner came in. And again, obviously, as a manager's manager, they have their own people that they probably like and what they want to do. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't probably his, his pick and fight, so you know. But what, what by my head and really for myself, which I wasn't too happy about, was was I always remember the game we, we played away at uh, we played away at where did we play? It was Wickham away live on Sky September the first. I remember September the first, two thousand and three, uh, and I scored scored the first goal and I set up the second goal. And the next the next game we played I think it was Burnley at home. I was on the bench. I was on the yeah. bench. I'm like, gee, what's going on here? Yeah. So I just I, I pulled him. I pulled the gaffer because we lost the game so he brought us all in on a Sunday so I, I pulled him up to the gaffer he's like to talk to you after so he goes I'll come even before training he came. He called me up in the office I went up to talk to him and Colin uh, oh, Colin what's the other guy I forgot his surname now the assistant was there Colin West that was it Colin West so he's, he pulled me in and he just had your audacity I said gaffer I want to talk to you why, why, why did I start why did I start yesterday you know, after last week and he had the audacity to pull out a piece of paper under his table, so it must have been premeditated. He knew I was coming to see him probably. He said, "These, these are the reasons why you never played." I'm like, "Okay." So go and I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the chair. He turns and he goes, "Yeah." He goes, "You're not fit enough. You don't score. You don't score enough goals. And you don't work hard enough." Uh, and so they were saying, "Kelsey." And I said, "I said, hold on." I said, <coughs> "I said, so what game? I said, so what game were you watching last week on the Monday?" And then he goes, "Oh, that's just a one-off. That's just a one-off." And I, I went, "You know what, Jeff?" I said, "I'm, I'm, I'm totally disagree with that." Blah blah blah. So anyway. We've got out to training. I don't know we've got out to training because obviously I've, I've just, I'm, I'm raging, I'm raging, I'm raging. And I must have gone in a few tackles and tried to smash everyone. And then he's pulled, he's pulled me aside. He goes, that's what I want to see. So he, he, was, he was after a reaction. Yeah. Goes, that's, that's what you've got to do on the pitch. So just one end as a manager. But yeah, he, he, he wasn't my, my favourite my favorite guy. But well, don't get me wrong, I've got no, nothing against any of the managers I've ever worked with. So if I see him, I, was, I mean, I give him time of day. And then luckily for myself, I've got an opportunity to leave Sheffield Wednesday uh, and go in a championship to to Reading so I was delighted to be fair even going from League 1 back up the division uh, I just had to, I just thought when Steve Koppel come calling I had to, do, I had to take it That's right you rejoined Steve Koppel at Reading with a load of other Brentford players again <laughs> Yeah it was weird because we actually when I was at Sheffield Wednesday we actually played Brighton 
Cop- when Coppel was at Brighton. So because Coppel would say that I hadn't been in the squad, like so I was always on the bench, he pulled me in his office and said, would you want to come on loan here? And I was like buzzing. I was like, hell yeah, I'll come on though. So he goes, okay, we'll sort something out for Monday. So I've got it. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it. I've got it on Monday to the training point. And okay, yeah, boys, I won't be here from the next week. I'm going on loan somewhere. I wouldn't tell him where. So anyway, next thing, on the Tuesday, I've only heard that Cops has got the job at Reading. I'm yeah. like, oh my God, cheers, that is, no, it looks like I'm dead at Sheffield Wednesday now. So yeah. I thought, oh no. So uh, next thing I'm thinking, I'd all the boys, because I told the boys I'm, I'm going, in the end I told them I was going bright, they're like, oh, lucky, I don't think you're going to download, are you? And I'm like, damn. So then a, week, a week's gone by, two weeks gone by, I get a phone call. Lloyd, steamy couple here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want you to come on loan to Reading. I'm like, I said, Gaffy, you trying to wind me up? He goes, no, I want you to come on loan. I've just spoken to Chris Turner and I was like, wow. So I've got into change. I was absolutely buzzing now. So I only thought, yeah. you know, like, this was December time. So yeah. anyway, I came back down to, came back down south, which was actually delighted to get back down. Kept signing on loan for a month, uh, initial month and then three months and then signed permanent. So it was just nice to be back down south. Championship football. Great, great bunch of lads. Great. It, this was, this was, this team of Brentford was just as good as my, my years at, at uh, and so the, the, Brent, the Reading lot was just as good as my Brent, my Brent from lot. It was just a great family club, and we just had a great time. You know, great place. Sidwell, Hughes, Glenn, Little, Graham, Murray, Shorey, uh, the list was then Eva, Arnhem, Harper. We just the list was endless. You know, so it was it was, it was a great time to be back. Yeah, it, I mean, seeing that. So you you've gone. I mean, like I said, you got to Wednesday. The, the difference between Brentford and Wednesday, I was just thinking, because obviously big crowd and stuff like that. Did you feel? Did you feel oh. the pressure? Oh, it was massive. It was massive. I mean, I think that's what everyone winds me up. I think, because obviously, I don't know if you remember that I actually puked up in that game. That's right. Was the, there was talk, uh, I, used to, I used to start puking up. I must have, I'm, when I look back at it now, it was all down to anxiety, really, Billy, you know? So, I mean, I'm not afraid to say that. When I look back, all of a sudden, I'm playing in front of 4,000 for the last four years. I'm playing in front of 4,000 Brentford fans, even though great fans and loud to go to play making my debut in front of 30,000 Sheffield Derby. It was just, it was just, just a different, just different feeling. And like I say, with Wednesday, everyone can that pitches. The pitch is so big. The stadium is huge. Everyone can see you. And I just, I guess I just felt the pressure, you know. And obviously, I had a bit of nerves and anxiety there. And I used to start puking up. But obviously, in the end, it, it became, it actually became a, uh, uh, a trademark. That I just used to do it just prior to any game, anyway. So, uh, right. yeah, right. so, so strange, but so, luckily it was, yeah. Yeah, so the difference would be you, you, you Sheffield Wednesday, big crowds, but the Reading, that was big crowds as well, but you obviously seemed to be a bit more comfortable with the environment there. Is it Was it because of the managers? Was it because of the fans? Was it was players that you were, that you knew that you play with? Yeah. You know, what was it? I think a bit of, a bit of both, really. Uh, and I think when you say less pressure, because like I said, at Sheffield, as much as any, all the other clubs I've been at, them fans are just, they are real diehard. They are. You, and you actually... You do feel you act like so you're on that pitch, you're on that Hillsborough pitch, and you feel all eyes on you. And you it's just the pressure. Some players can end it, some can't, and it's just so pressure. But we're ready. It's very, very much like Brentford family club. The fans don't give you as much sort of grief and everything. They just they, go, they sort of go they, they go they go with the punches. They just roll with you. Obviously, cops are very calm and manager. The players again, you know, what I mean, just teammate, real good teammates. So that, that was a much more easier transition going to. Uh, Going to Reading, even again playing in front of twenty thousand week in week out was, was quality as well. Yeah, so you were saying obviously the Cambridge game where we won the third division championship was your best game ever. But what was your best game yeah. at Reading then? Or your favourite best game? game at Reading? Uh, my favourite game was probably at Selhurst Park. We beat we beat Crystal Palace three one, I think it was. And I scored two goals in that game, and it was a, it was a real a real cut and throat game, you know. It was a good crowd at, at Selhurst Park, you know, and yeah, we we had we just played really well that day, and uh, yeah, I scored two really good goals. I was I was delighted with that performance individually it was for myself. Yeah, yeah. So after we left Reading, you came back to Brentford in two thousand and five. Mad Dog Allen yeah. put a phone call in, didn't he? Yeah, it was weird because I still had a year left. I still had a year left at Reading on my deal, uh, but fair play to Copper again because of, like I said his land management skills. He pulled me in the office and learned. Probably as soon as I can't guarantee that you'll be playing week in and week out, I'm bringing certain strikers in. And he goes, you look, you're more than willing to fight for your place. Uh, or you, you're more than willing, or I can, we can, the club can come up with a, uh, a settlement and then you can look for other opportunities. 
And for me, for me, I'm a kind of guy. As much as like I'm a fighter, don't get me wrong, but I, I want, I want to play regular football. Uh, so for me to come back to Brentford or to anyone at the time who were keen, and regardless of playing championship, I was happy. It wasn't about the money at all. It wasn't even about the money. Obviously, like you can imagine, I probably took a massive pay cut coming from Reading to to Brentford, and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to go back to a place that I know that I love. Uh, and and still wanted again and, and real and play regular football and obviously Martin Allen he could guarantee me that obviously no play don't get me wrong no players ever guaranteed to play week in and week out but if you know your performances are there you know yeah, no one else can take it away from you by than yourself and I knew I'd go to Brentford do well and yeah again loved it loved it so it was good to come home well, it was good because people sometimes say you know you mustn't go back out with the, with the next girlfriend but you know you've gone around the houses yeah. you've tried a few girls and then you've come back to your ex-girlfriend you know, was yeah. it really as good, or was it always the first time? Is it always going to be the best? The first time is always going to be the best because, like I say, everything that happened for me individually, first season, fantastic. You can't ask for anything better. But the second year, the second time I come around, it was still, it was actually good because Benville was still in a buzz because Martin had done the gaffer done pretty well the season before the boys with the playoffs, obviously losing to the semis, I believe, and then he, he did send a good team. Uh, and I thought, yeah, you know what, I want to be part of this. I believe that. I believe we can get promoted to the championship and again, really close again. But the one for, for myself was a bit bad at getting injured to the to the latter stage of that season. And I don't want to sound big-headed, but I honestly feel like if I was fit uh, and I was and I was playing because I was on, I was enjoying. I was, I was probably playing my best, my probably some of my best football ever. Uh, I honestly think we, we would have got promoted. You know, I'm going to ask you about that yeah. because the back end of that season, I mean, we're the perennial playoff losing team you know we're mm. talking about in that season we were getting to the well, we got to the playoff semi-final again who was it that we played Swansea I think it was Swansea that was a Swansea yeah, year yeah. that we played Swansea yeah, and yeah. Yeah. if I remember rightly you got injured was it playing for Ghana I got injured playing for Ghana yeah that's right you were playing Stuttgart so, um, yeah FC Stuttgart for away in Germany that's right now really I mean I mean, remember you got a, a very last-minute call for Ghana, and you took it. You know, yep. with, with, you know, Ghana were going for the World Cup. We're going to play in the World Cup. Yep. And they were looking for players. You thought this this could be my opportunity. I mean, obviously, in mm. retrospect, you turn around and say, oh, "I wish I didn't go." But you know, how important really was that Ghana game against Stuttgart? Or you, you know, was it because we, when you went, we were yeah, looking like, "Why is he going to Stuttgart? Why did he stay here with Brentford?" Like you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, in in, in the guise of the actual game, it wasn't an important game. As in, you know, I mean, that's the sort of, you know, playing against another nation. Just, it was just a club game, a national team against a club team. But from my aspect, it was a World Cup year. And the way I was playing at Brentford, if I get a call from a national team to go and play and anything could have happened. And then, I mean, I, to be, uh, I mean, I'll probably, realistically, I'll probably, if, if I hadn't got injured, uh, from what I've been told from, especially from the coach at the time, Djokovic, he told me I would have been, I would have been in one of the, I would have been in the squad in the 23-man squad, you know. Uh, so for that, on that, I think I hear back now, I was a bit gutted. But like I said, this life, I just had to roll with the punches. But luckily, I got a chance to go out to Germany and, and see a few games, so soften the blow a bit. Yeah, and then we put a play, playoff semi-final against Swansea. Did you actually travel down with the players? I, mean, I know you were injured at the time. Yeah, well, I didn't go to, I didn't go to your away game. Uh, I, think, I think I must have... I don't, no, I don't think I didn't go to your away game because I remember the home game. You know, scores. I thought I go to your away game. I, I probably did go to your away game. Yeah, I probably did. But then, yeah, the home game I remember uh, ninety scoring that good goal. And uh, yeah, they beat us. Nice. You know, they went eventually to go on and get promoted. That's right. And they haven't again. They haven't looked back since because they've just gone on a trajectory, yeah. and they've got an ethos which is yeah. probably quite similar to how Brentford are trying to get an ethos about Thank how their club is run at the moment Definitely. now. You know, Definitely. but yes. Yeah, so, I mean, again, big dejection. How did the team feel after losing that semi? I mean, again, we've lost another playoff. I mean, how, how do they feel? Yeah. Nah, everyone was down. Everyone was down and gutted, you know. So close, but so near, you know. Uh, you know I mean, they worked hard in the season. Because, again, even we should have got even automatic. Because I remember, I think it was, I think we drew, was it, Black, was it Blackpool or something? I think the week before, to get even automatic promotion, I think we needed to win. I think we ended up drawing the game. And we would have yeah. been a few points clear or so, I think it was. So that was a bit that was a bit cut in that way. And then obviously going to the playoffs, so yeah, everyone was everyone was down. Yeah. We have got, got a question actually from a Brighton fan as well. And his name's Sam Peters. And he just wants to know yeah. what did you think of your time at Brighton? 
and also your striking partnership with Gary Hart. Yeah, Brighton was fantastic, you know. Uh, I got a call up to go. I got a call up to go there on loan from Cheltenham. I remember them being, I think, about eight points adrift from from safety. You know, they were struggling. Uh, so what I division? Went in, I went in the club, uh, League Two. So League One, sorry, League One, League One. Eight points adrift. I no expectations to really go in straight away and play, but yeah, I went in, played straight away, uh, and then it just went from strength to strength. Fourteen games, seven goals. And then yeah, we stayed up. We stayed up, and yeah, we stayed up, and uh, it was amazing with Hardy. He was actually out. He was at, on the outer at the club, and then he got called in because I think there was a couple of injuries. And then he just from, yeah, again another. We were thirty plus strikers. Uh, me and him just went on, the, went on a mad, mad run the last three or four games, just scoring for fun. Or he, to be fair, he was seeing creating for me. So um, that, that was that was brilliant, brilliant time. Great club, great fans again. This is great. And we were down in Brighton a couple of weeks ago. We actually beat them. On their turf, which was nice, you know. So we, we got the goal. We went to the new stadium, the Amex Stadium, which is just yeah. outside outside Falmer as well. You know, mm. wicked new stadium. A little bit quiet in the home end, we have to say. But um, we had a good day out. Two two thousand three hundred Brentford fans made a load of noise down there, and uh, it's kind of set us on the run that we are now as well. Um, you must have had a favourite game you played at Brighton. Wow, well, <laughs> favourite game at Brighton, I would say. Uh, so, had us, uh, was it, had, who was it we played at home? No, Oldham. I remember we had a great. I scored two goals against Oldham uh, at home. Uh, that, that was a real good game. But I would say yeah. the pinnacle game would probably be Bristol City because it was a spec. It was a. It was our. Because the, the first I actually signed for them, we had, I travelled. I met the boys at Bristol, but the game got postponed because of the weather. So that's why we had a few games in hand. So the Brighton game, the, the game against Bristol uh, Bristol Rovers, was uh, a rearranged game. And uh, we, it was it was a must it was a must win game it was just it was a must win game otherwise we would just been really out of the mix and uh, yeah again we won that game two one with Gary Hart setting me up and it was just us yeah, scored a really good goal near post I was really happy with that and uh, yeah we, from there we just went on and just you know, I think we were from there undefeated in the, the season in the last four or five games yeah that sounds good. and then you know other clubs you went to I know you went to Yeovil you went to to Luton. Yeah. I mean, I know that you didn't have a great time yeah. again at Luton. Was yeah, it? Luton was a bit gutted really because I was I went there I went there came from Adelaide signed there uh, with Gary Mun- uh, with uh, with Mr Money Richard Money uh, had a great time there fourteen games I played seven goals flying flying and then uh, sort of Gary Brabham sort of disrespected me he, he took over the manager's role and uh, I don't even know why Gary, uh, why Richard Money got sat was sat because at the time he, he had the best ratio as a manager at Luton. Uh, he got the, he got the tic tac. I had a couple of backstabbing behind him, which I felt for him. And then Gary Brabham came in. We ended up we ended up making it to the final, uh, the playoff final at, at Man City's ground. And uh, I'm thinking, happy days. At least I'm going to be in the squad because I, you know, I mean, I've done well since I've been there. But prior to that, when he took over the manager, he pulled me and goes, "Oh, uh, give, give it the old age age one." And I'm like, hold on, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure I've played 14 games and scored seven goals. I've been on fire. It sounds a lot of me. They were fantastic. And then he goes, oh, I guess I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to let you rest here, here, there, everywhere. That's a trade. I'm like, hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying my football. Why are you going to stop me? So he just doesn't against me. And then all of a sudden, playoff final, uh, as much as I love uh, uh, Crowley, he'd been injured for 10 weeks, hadn't, hadn't trained with us. He trained with us the day before the final. He just come back from rehab. Hadn't, hadn't played ten weeks, so we're all in the change room. And I, was, I just had a feeling. I just had a feeling. I'm, I'm not going to be involved in the team. Too. I just had a feeling about it. So we're all doing our warm up. Everyone's walking around the pitch having a look. Uh, obviously, a, a support, just uh, giving the fans a little high fives, etc. But the day everyone went back in to get ready, and for so I always remember I was walking, and he he sort of Gary Bradley sort of waited until he saw me at the, at the last minute. He's pulled me in. Uh, into the side goes, I know I'm aware. I said, uh, I said, I said, and I knew it. I said, don't even fit. I said to him, I said to him, don't you even think about telling me what you're going to tell me now. He goes, uh, he goes uh, I'm going to go, I'm going with Crowley today. I said, what? He goes, I'm going to put Crowley on the bench. I said, oh, I said, hold on. Crowley hasn't been playing for 10 weeks, trained yesterday, and you're putting him in front of me. He went, yeah, just, I think he gives us a, a bit, something a bit better dimension. I went, okay. So I've gone into the change room, and just sat down, and all the boys, obviously, they're already sitting there waiting for him to name the team. They could all see I was raging, so I'm sitting down. He's on the team, and even when he said Crowley's name, 
Crowey himself even was on the bench. And all the boys in the changing room even looked, were, everyone was stunned. And, and you know what, the top of what really done my head in, didn't he? He didn't even yeah. bring Crowey on after extra time. Yeah. If he was so much important yeah. to play, he didn't even bring him on and they lost on penalties. And I yeah, no, no, I don't care what anyone says. If I was playing, if I was playing in that game against AFC Wimbledon, I was on fire. I was enjoying my yeah. football. We, I think we, I would have done it. I would have just, that's just just where my football career has gone. Anything I've that's touched in right. kind of important games, it's happened, mate. So yeah. I was so angry, I, but yeah, I can yeah. imagine that. And it was the, and that was the playoff, um, the playoff final, the playoff final at Man City. Yep. From the conference yep. into the football league, yep. Luton versus AFC Wimbledon. I mean, I remember I went up on the uh, at AFC Wimbledon with my mates. I went up there on the motorway with them on a little coach yep. AFC, and I remember texting you just saying, you know, I'll, you know, I might catch you later. And you remember you texted me back saying, I ain't playing, Bill. And I was I was shocked. Yeah. And I mm. told my AFC Wimbledon friends, I said, Lloyd Russo isn't playing. And they said, Phew, that's a chance for us. And, you know, we might actually get a chance mm. to win this game. You know, and they did. But that's, yeah. you know, that's again, I must be gutted for you. But, you know, like I said, you came from Adelaide to go to Luton. So Adelaide obviously gave yeah. you a little first taster of Australia. How was that yeah. when you played for them? Yeah, it was good, man. It was, it was different. Don't get me wrong. I mean, when I first heard about him, I said, no, dude, as well. Do you even want to think about coming to Australia? But then the opportunity, I thought I spoke to a couple of guys who were really playing for them, and then they said, you've got to come have a look. It's a great way of life, great lifestyle. So I came out and had a look. And I thought, you know what? It's decent, to be fair. And they were, they were due to play Champions League, Asian Champions League, football, etc. But again, it didn't have to plan for me because as soon as I arrived, I got struck down with swine flu and pneumonia. And then I was just on the back burner from day one, so... Things didn't really materialise for me in Adelaide, but that's life. But at the end of the day, I'm blessed to obviously have an opportunity to actually live out here now and be a permanent resident. So I guess it was a blessing, you know. And, and so talk to me about this because now we're going to move into your, your new life. You, Adelaide, you came back home, but in the end, you said, Tell you something, I'm going to go back to, to Australia. I mean, there was a couple of sort of kind yeah. of little dodgy little moments that you had, you know, the uh, the Indonesian team, Bethla Bandung Raya, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you were yeah. going to be player manager, then they just, there was something funky going on there, wasn't there? Yeah, it was stupid, because what happened when my mate was the, the manager, so I was going to go and be player coach for him as assistant. Uh, but because my last club I was playing for in, in Adelaide, in Adelaide, White City, was non-league, the Indonesian league, they deemed me as, they deemed, they deemed me as a semi-professional player. And even regardless of my CV, so they, they couldn't sign. But then in the end, someone paid someone apparently, and then they turned around and said, "Yeah, we'll sign him now." But prior to that, they needed to sign someone ASAP. So they, they found someone else to sign prior to the window closing. So when they agreed for me to sign, they already signed a player. So I think in the end, I didn't sign. So I just thought, you know what, I'm not having this hassle. I'm just going to get rid of this. Come back, come back to Australia. So it was a bit of a blessing to be also- because my mate who ended up, yeah, it was, it was crazy out there for them in the end. That's mad. And also, you had a madness zone when you were going to up your family and go to Paphos in, uh, yeah, yeah, Paphos and play for them. Another that was a bit strange, wasn't it? Yeah, so I, I, yeah, again, so I, I went there, signed an okay deal there, a year deal. Uh, I always remember just about to tell, they got the flights, anything booked for us, for the family, and then uh, next, all of a sudden, uh, I was on the training pitch. And I see some of the directors come and take some of the players' cars, some of our cars off. They just drove off in our cars. I thought, what's going on here? So I found my agent yeah, at the time, the secret agent. I said, what's going on? They go, oh, the club aren't paying some of the players, so I want to get you out of there. So I said, hell yeah, get me out. I was not having that. So, you yeah, know, luckily, luckily I didn't end up staying there too long. So, you know, it was a blessing. Yeah, that that was You've got the Australian thing going on now. I mean, I chatted to you the other day and you said, you know, what you're up to, you said, you know, call me at this time, Bill, because I'm just coming back from the beach, you know. You know it was, I think it was hailing or snow outside, like, you know. I just thought, cheers, Lloyd, that's exactly what I want to hear. But you've got a you've got a nice lifestyle out there. You've got a bit of football going on. Yeah. You've got your family that's moved out there. You seem very settled. I mean, tell, tell us a bit about the Australian runnings and what's going on there and where you live and what the vibe is. Yeah, listen, it's, it's such a great lifestyle. Yeah. And for me, it was more for the kids anyway. The transition was more for how I want my kids to be raised. Uh, from when I was here, and I, when, I used to, when I was first here, my little girl was out and about all the time, you know. She's always on the beach or on a, there's a, she's at a park, which is safe. Because when I was in England, I was living in Rotherhive, and no disrespect, there was nowhere for her to go. Parks had, I mean, needles there and just, just rubbish weather. And I'm thinking to myself, do I really want a jail grown up like this? 
So that's why I made the decision to come back to Australia, and it was it was it was, it was, it was a perfect choice because, like I said, she gets out both of them now. They get outdoor living. Everything's on the doorstep. They've got the beach on the doorstep. They've got bays. They've got parks. It's just everything's just fresh, and they and they're living a healthy lifestyle, you know. So that's why I to, that's why I had to do it for them. That's nice. And I mean, you talked to again the other day. I think it was yesterday. You took your daughter to athletics as well, and yeah. that's coming back to the Abusu family. It's a big athletics family, and yeah. if you weren't a footballer, yeah. you'd possibly been an athlete, isn't it? Yeah, but I mean, I was doing athletics prior to me being a footballer. You know, uh, my sister was like many people know. She's a, a British champ, former British three A's champion, and ran for Great Britain. And even now, she's actually the world champion at the Vets. She's actually they broke the world record for the four by two. I think it was, and she's the four hundred meter champion for the Vets over thirty fives. But uh, yeah, athletics was quality. I used to love it. But yes, yeah, we we've come from a sporting family, and uh, my little girl, hopefully, and my little boy, they'll follow suit. And uh, she does everything here. She did even yesterday, like you said, I took her running in the morning. Then in the afternoon, she had her gymnastics. She does tennis, basketball. She just does everything. So she's, she's a very lucky girl. That's good, man. Following in the, the footsteps of, of Big Daddy there. you know. So tell us about Australia. You know, there's a couple of other clubs that you played for. Like I said, it's, it's White City and you did a little Sydney thing. So, yeah. what, you know, what's going on there? Yeah, so White City is just uh, here in, in each state in, in Australia has their sort of top semi-professional league, like the Ryman Prem. So uh, when I was in Adelaide, I was playing for a team, a Serbian team called White City. When I first joined, they were actually in the division below uh, the top state league. And then uh, <clears throat> the, season when I, the season I played for them, uh, we got promoted into the top league of the state. And uh, yeah, we've done, we done well. We got, even got to the final the following season of the of the cup, of the uh, Corporation Cup, but we lost that on penalties. But uh, yeah, that was, that was great. And then here in Sydney last season, ended up again playing for a team called... Sydney City T East, aka Akoa, who were a massive club back in the day in the old NSL, the old National Soccer League, under the guidance of Frank Lowy, who, whether people, not many people might not know who he is, he's the FSA actual founder. He's a, the money man behind the, he owns Westfield, the Westfield shopping mall, that's, that's his. He's still part of the club now, uh, Akoa. And again, this season, I had a great year with them. Last year, we won everything. We got promoted to the second top tier. We won the club championship. I won Golden Boot, and also I won the best player in the league. So uh, I just thought, you know, why it's all good, and we end up in the high. That's why I decided to like sort of call it time now. You know, that's right. And you've basically decided to retire from football because you you felt you'd done what you wanted to do now. And does that mean that you're carrying on with the coaching and stuff? Is that right? Yeah, as much as I know, I've still got loads of left in the tank to play. Everyone, I've even got a lot of these local teams wants me to still play, but because of where I am in Sydney, uh, in Terrigal now, which is Eight ninety kilometers north of Sydney, and the kids are back back there. So I just thought it wouldn't be fair if I'm going to be out playing every week and not seeing them all the time. So I just thought, you know what, it's more of a cho- it's more of a choice for them now for me to do my coaching in the week and at the weekend get more quality time with the kids. You know, so uh, yeah, life, life, life's good, so I can't complain. That's good, and, and I'm, in- I'm interested as well because I mean we don't see it as much as you might see, you know, other other football in other countries, but. How different is Aussie football? I mean, I know Emil Heskey went over there. I mean, Robbie Fowler was over there from time. You get quite mm. a few Brits come over. What's the what's the level like, and and how popular is it? I mean, I know it's getting more and more popular, but you know, what's what's going down? Yeah, it's, it's, it is good. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. It's a it's a very new league, some ten years in existence now than the actual the actual A league anyway. So uh, it's, it's growing, like you say, big players, Fowler, uh, Heskey. Pierre have all come over, they've all graced these shores, you know. Uh, the football the football's getting much better and like you can even see some of these some of the young Australian boys who are in the national team as well coming through. So uh, the football's good, it's getting better, it's only getting better and I think it's gonna be one of the top codes in the next five to ten years. Uh, obviously AFL here, the Aussie Bulls is number one, but more kid more kids are playing football soccer they call it here than all the other codes. So that's a that's a great that's a great ratio to have. Yeah, so going through a few of the other questions as well, I mean, what was the toughest, you know, coming back to the UK, what was the toughest opponent you ever played against? Toughest opponent? <clears throat> I would say, definitely I would say Sol Campbell. Uh, him and I remember playing against him, obviously when he was at Tottenham, when we played him when I was at Brentford. He was there. Sylvain Distan once when I played even just a friendly game when I was at the Oval, he was... Him and Zoe and even Sol was even there at Portsmouth together. Them two were just like a rock. Could not get past them. Uh, the old Danny Shitu, the old QPR, Millwall centre-half. He was another, yeah. 
Another he actually scored, a, actually scored a winning goal for Brentford this season against Millwall. It was an own goal. Oh, yeah? We love him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we started yeah, singing his name and everything. Oh, quality. Yeah. So, I mean, the toughest. Also, Jacob Allen asks, what was your best Brentford goal? My best Brentford goal would be, I would always have to say, away to Blackpool. Uh, 2002. Was it yeah, 2002? Was it? Yeah, 2002 it was. When uh, I think Evo's played the ball around the corner, we've, we've beaten 3 1, and I flicked it up. Uh, with my, I think I flicked it up with my left foot, and I spat and volleyed it with my right, and it just got tobbed it by about 25 yards. I was actually bit buzzing with that, and it actually got gold a month, so I was really happy with that goal. Well, the best player you played with all across all the teams? Wow. Across the board, it's, it's a big one, man. Obviously, I've when I played for Ghana, when I first ever met Mark Wessie, and when I remember when I played my first game for Ghana at FC Mets, meeting to playing with him, he was unbelievable. Stephen Appear, uh, but club level wise, played with, oh, wow, wow, man, that's, that's a big one, you know. It's, I don't even, even played like, what people, you know, anyone will know, even the trouble to Bond, uh, again, a very, when I was at Sheffield Wednesday. A very lazy player, but just had a technical ability. It was just unbelievable. He was the way he was strikeable, and he was just his touch was for someone who was about six foot five. He was he, he was fantastic. He was a good player, but there's a few. There's a, there was a few other few, but I can't top of my head now. Yeah, yeah. Was, but he was definitely one of them. James Allen asks, "How did you come up with your lofting iconic celebration?" It was, I think, it was by accident. To be fair, it was an accident. I think I just remember one game, Charlotte and at home. I scored a goal for my world. That's been a free kick or corner header. I just run away. And I just pump my hands in the air, just 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 out of just out of chance. And then all of a sudden, I remember the next game, Peter Gillum saying my name, and then all the fans started doing it. So it just sort of follows suit from there, you know. So yeah, That's just right. maybe, yeah, so just like, yeah. And we still do that. I can do the Owusu, just putting your hands above your head, up and down, up and down. You know, it yeah. still goes on. Actually, we still we still oh, see it in the pubs every now and again. You know, but it, did it follow you? Every club you went to, did you sort of do it at yeah. Wednesday and Reading? Yeah. And, and the Reading, fans got behind it as well, did they? Yeah, everyone, everyone, every club I've been to will raise the roof. Yeah. Raise the roof, mate. Brilliant. Okay, so that's absolutely fantastic. And also, like back in the day, the players had quite a relaxed attitude to sort of kind of mingling with the fans. I mean, you used to come down, I used to come down to Slough, down to Windsor, just to hang out with you sometimes. You used to mm. come out, I used to come out, come down to the pub and meet us. I used to come down to North London and meet me when I was living up there. Um, you used to pop into the pub after the game just to just chat to the fans. Um, Bradley Bates asked, do you remember going into the Bricklayer's Arms with Ija after a game one season? He says, do you remember that at all? Please, I do remember taking him to go into Slough. Uh, I do, uh, very, very vaguely, very vaguely. But that for me, it's all about the fans. Man. At the end of the day, if it wasn't for the fans, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be on the pitch playing, you know. Otherwise, you pay our money and everything. So, for me, it's all about giving back to the fans. That's why I love, you know what I mean, mingling with them and giving something back to them. That's right. So listen, Lloyd, it's late there now. It's early here now. We've just lost to Middlesbrough. It's not a problem at all, you know, because we're going to move forward. Obviously, uh, you're keeping an eye out for all the Brentford results, as you say. You know, you yeah. keep an eye out as the next player. So, I mean, what's what's next for you now? In the next few weeks or the next few months? I know that you're going away for a week, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going away camping tomorrow morning to be fair with the school, the inter- with the international football school that I work at. So uh, that'll be good. It's only, the, it's only the second week. The kids are in turn, and I'm already away camping with them. So that could be very interesting. Uh, but other than that, yeah, it's just about planning for the whole year. Uh, and then, like I said, I'm just for me, it's all new. This school, so it's a new challenge for myself. That's what I'm looking forward to doing, you know. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be good, and like I said, me giving back something to the kids that I'm coaching. That's nice, man. Listen, Lloyd, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today, and absolutely, you were down at Brentford, and a lot of people wanted to hear your tales and hear what's going down. You know, good luck. I know you've retired from football on the playing side, but you've still got a lot going for you. So you know, respect to you. Good luck to you. And your family as well, having a good time down there. Thank you. And as you know, I mean, I know it's a long way, so it's not like you could pop in. But at any time you want to, you know you're welcome down at Griffin Park. You know we still drink Thank in exactly you. the same places. You can pop down there, you can say hello, and you'll be given a big hero's welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. That's right. Pleasure. Man.
And we're going to catch up with you later, Lloyd, yeah? Definitely. Cheers, pal.